The story and history of Queen Mary's Hospital, Roehampton, began a year after the First World War commenced in 1914, 1914. By January 1915, it was becoming clear that the war, embarked on with such confidence, was to last longer than anticipated and have much more devastating consequences than anyone had foreseen. It was soon recognized that medical services supporting the war wounded were totally inadequate and needed to be developed at speed. One day, Miss Gwyn Holford, one of the strong women activists at the time, was walking through the wards at the Millbank Military Hospital with the matron, just after the first exchange of prisoners of war from Germany. A patient there, Private F.W. Chapman, had lost two arms, and he had been given a substitute for the arms of two leather sockets with hooks attached. Is this all my country can do for me, he complained to the two ladies. That was the moment when Gwyn Holford made a commitment that she would work towards one aim, to start a hospital whereby soldiers who had lost limbs could be fitted with the most perfect artificial limbs possible. Gwyn Holford worked with influential contacts. She wrote to the Times and an appeal was raised for funds. Roehampton House had all, already been requisitioned by the War Office at the time and used as a billet for soldiers. It was agreed by the War Office that the house could be released, supported by Mr. Charles Kennedine at the time. He became Director of Artificial Limb Supplies at the Ministry of Pensions and was knighted in 2018. On the 20th of June, 1915, the doors were opened and 25 patients were admitted. £19,000, £715 had been raised in donations and grants and Queen Mary had become a patron. The hospital was called Queen Mary's Convalescent Auxiliary Hospital. By June 1916, there were 550 beds. This slide shows the founders of the hospital, the key players in getting the hospital up and running. Matron Amy Munn, Adjutant Captain Nicholson, who you saw on the previous slide, and Miss Gwyn Holford. This is a photograph of Gwyn Holford, as you see, with hospital staff. And there in the back row is Frank Chapman. Note his hat, and he's in the typical attire of the patients at Queen Mary's Roehampton. I think it was a sort of washable uniform. And he will feature later in my slides. And there we have a VAD with the Red Cross on her apron and one of the nurses at the back and other staff, probably a housekeeper. The hospital became very busy. And here you can see the first tranche of staff you, hear the, you see the nurses and the VADs in their crisply starched uniforms. And you see the medical aides in the front. And then in the second row, you'll be able to recognize the founders and certainly Miss Amy Munn with her hat on. And, and also Miss Holford. Now, this is a photo that to me is rather evocative of the times and this awful phrase, fragments from France and elsewhere meet the future full of faith and hope. 
And these were the war wounded taken at Roehampton, as you will see, between somewhere between 1916 and 1917. And I think you, it shows you, it, it so vividly shows you the severity of their injuries. They were all amputees, some um, with all four limbs affected, some one in the front there has lost both his legs and, the, and another one in the center um, in his wheelchair. Now, Roehampton didn't only provide treatment and care for the patients that came into the hospital, were admitted into the hospital, but it also provided a lot of activities out of doors. Now, if you think about it, in these early days, there were no antibiotics. Treatment was really very simple, good nursing care, uh, rather rudimentary surgery to uh, tidy up their stump so that they were fit for the fitting of artificial limbs and also improving their basic health. And they needed to get out in the fresh air. You can imagine a lot of these men came from the battlefields uh, with infections, severe infections, even gangrene. So actually it couldn't have been very pleasant for either patients or the staff working in the hospitals with perhaps um, on a cold day, closed windows. But most of the time, if you see an old photo of the hospital, the windows are wide open. And I think for very good reason. So here we are, the nurses, um, uh, that's uh, Amy Munn on the right, and they're all, they're looking after the patients and having a recreational afternoon. And that is one of the famous pine trees in the grounds of Queen Mary's Hospital. And here's another picture, perhaps that's the son of one of the uh, patients standing up smartly in the front. So we have many of these pictures in the archives. This is a game in the garden. I think that gentleman dancing has a kilt on, doesn't he? And um, the tartan sash, etc. So generally, you remember that patients came from all over the country. Um, they just didn't live around London. They were from far and wide. Now, one of the patients I've talked about earlier is Frank Chapman. And he was quite a character in the hospital for one reason or another. I would have thought he's quite a patient leader. And here he is in his uniform, but he, this is after he was wounded because you can see one, uh, the right, his right sleeve, it, it really is empty. It demonstrate, you know, you can see it's empty. There's no limb there. And on the left-hand side, he probably has an artificial limb on this. It's obviously one can see something there. And that's him, Frank Chapman, in uniform, rehabilitated, probably on a home visit. And here we are, he's in the garden, demonstrating the skills that they learnt. You note he's smoking a cigarette and many of the soldiers, it was a the fashion then, they thought it was, um, they didn't realize it was damaging and it was a comfort and just something that um, soldiers normally did, calm their nerves, et cetera, et cetera, but wasn't very good for their circulation when you were trying to heal wounds. And here's Frank, he's gardening, he's on a bicycle and he just shows how the patients at Roehampton were not only treated, but rehabilitated into society. So hopefully, after all, they're young men, hopefully they can go back into the working world of employment once they are um, basically fit and well again. Here's Frank with some of his colleagues in the sun at Roehampton. And then again, all with their cigarettes, I think, without fail, yep. And here's Frank again on his wedding day. He actually got married whilst he was at Roehampton. And I think he must have got married at a local church, but anyway, he came here certainly afterwards. And there we are, the, um, 
the all the his his colleagues uh, making um, archway for him, and they are dressed in again the basic everyday uniform of the hospital that they had to wear. And this is another photo on his wedding day with both mother-in-laws um, sitting in front and the matron. And I would have thought the father-in-laws at the back, etc. And Frank looking incredibly proud. You can see his prosthetic left hand here. And here is a letter to Frank with best wishes for his future happiness and grateful recollections of his many kindness, kindnesses from the Lim office. So he must have been a very popular patient at Roehampton. And you can see, I only recognize one signature there, and that is Miss Holford. This is the old envelope. We must have been given the, the letter and the envelope, et cetera, and some of the photos by one of his relatives. This often happened. We didn't generally know, or we don't generally know much about the patients. There were so many hundreds and thousands over the years. But some of, for some of them, the relatives, uh, when the patient had died or um, perhaps uh, before they had died, they wanted us to have memories and the sort of relics of um, their time at Roehampton. And so they uh, donated them to our archives and we were delighted. And others have gone to the Imperial War Museum and, um, uh, you know, distributed appropriately. And here is a letter he actually wrote when he, with his artificial hand, he tells Nellie, he apologizes for saying, I'm not writing very well, but it, I'm doing the best I can. And he's talking about a home visit. And it's quite, it's quite obvious. I think this is when they were only courting. And he, he, he makes it clear that uh, Nellie is going to have to look after him. This is uh, another patient at Queen Mary's with quite an interesting story, which we know about. Arnold Loosemore survived Gallipoli only to be sent to the Somme. He was awarded the Victoria Cross for immense bravery under heavy enemy fire. Then a year later, bravely led his battered unit back to the safety of their own lines earning the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Badly wounded in October 1918, he lost his left leg above the knee. He died in 1924 from tuberculosis and was given a military funeral. His near destitute wife and small son were refused a war widow's pension, and yet she was sent the bill for the funeral. Arnold was buried, actually buried, in an existing grave with three others to save money. Arnold Loosemore's forgotten courage is now remembered with a street named after him, Sheffield. Another patient was Lance Corporal Alfred Hart, buried alive, saved by his stick. Alfred Hart was injured at Ypres in Belgium. German engineers tunneled under his trench and detonated explosives, burying him alive. This was quite a common activity of both sides, um, Germans and British, that they would dig under the enemy's trenches and then bomb, bomb them from underneath causing devastation. So he was buried alive, but three days later, a British soldier, soldier noticed the silver tip of a swagger stick carried by most off-duty soldiers poking out through the sand. He bent down to pull it out of the soil and got the surprise of his life to feel the stick being pulled back by a badly injured but determined Lance Corporal Alfred Hart at the other end. Rescued from a premature burial, Alfred's leg was amputated. 
He spent many years in rehabilitation at Roehampton. So time went on. Patients were learning new skills. This was in the one of the workshops. And they were even learning to build artificial limbs, prosthetic limbs. And this, of course, was very appropriate, really, because who better could help people who needed artificial limbs than people who had gone through the same experience themselves and were showing how they could actually be employed and do a constructive and vital job. Here we are, we have a group in the physiotherapy department. And what about artificial limbs at those times? These are a, a typical uh, collection of artificial limbs. They were made of tin, these, and then painted to look as realistic as possible. Rather clumpy, but they were used, um, they're still used today. Um, and sort of have been used right through the ages, particularly in, in relation to lower limb amputations. Because if you think about it, lower limb amputees basically need strong structures to walk on. But you will see later that the limbs of today, some limbs of today, the majority of limbs today are very, very different to these. These are mostly worn by perhaps older people still who've had them for years. Here we are, this is a rather sad picture of a rather handsome young man, probably tall, wearing artificial limbs, it makes you a bit shorter. Originally he looked very tall, long arms, and here he is, double amputee. And here are some more upper arm amputees. And this is a hand. It's, uh, it's more uh, di disabling to lose upper arms on the whole, because if you think about it, legs are your support and arms are, and your hands are used very much for manipulation all the time throughout the day. And if they're much more difficult to replace adequately, although technology has certainly made great advances in um, the proficiency of artificial limbs today. This is a production line at Roehampton. And here we are, the workshop team, just showing you a small sample, but how many, you know, I say small, because it is small in a factory, you would have a lot more than that. There were several factories on site eventually, but you needed a very big team to meet the demands of war to support these patients at Roehampton. And here is perhaps a, a, um, an advertisement for one of the main artificial limb providers at Roehampton, Hugh Steeper Limited. And this is rather an inappropriate caption for today's um, um, a, a view from today, if you like. Victory over empty sleeves, because they provide the upper arm amputees. So you get the uh, picture, victory over empty sleeves. I had some royal visits over the years, as you can imagine. Queen Mary, of course, came, and Alicia Mendes was at Queen Mary's for many, many years. She was still there when I um, worked at Queen Mary's in the, uh, from the early 70s, and I'll tell you more about that later. And here is George V, third left. There's another one of him in the middle. And then I don't know who this was, but a member of royalty. And you can see our matron, our rather, um, what you want to say, glorious um, Amy Munn in all her splendor, uh, welcoming the royal visitor to the hospital. And this is to the rear of Ro Roehampton House, going down the steps to the garden. So here we are again, we're in 19, 1939, 
But before we get there, I'll just tell you about a little bit about the intervening years. By 1920, the hospital had gained a reputation for treatment and care. But after the end of the First World War, its future was by no means secure. And it went through a very uncertain period post-war and patient numbers fell. However, through much argument, argument and debate, the hospital survived to be administered by the Ministry of Pensions. In 1925, it was renamed Queen Mary's Hospital. Major development took place, resulting in a fully equipped hospital on the Queen Mary's site. The hospital expanded its services to include plastics and maxillofacial surgery and burns treatment by the 1930s, but it was an aging community. There were war pensioner residential patients and many of the staff as possible were ex-servicemen. There is a quote discussing the use of the extensive grounds. The sisters are not now in their first youth and after a hard and exacting period of duty, do not feel like leaving the precincts of the hospital. At the commencement of the Second World War, 550 beds were requested to bring the, bed, the number up to 900. 17 new brick wards were built, Residential patients were moved to the Star and Garter at Richmond. This had been built in 1924 to provide accommodation and nursing facilities for 180 seriously ill servicemen, seriously injured servicemen, not only amputees. At the same time, the limb fitting centre and on-site factories were also extended. The plan under the emergency scheme was to use the hospital initially for all casualties and then as the system settled down to reserve it for the treatment of amputees, fractures and facial injury cases. Around 20,000 ex-servicemen and 2,000 civilians were treated at Roehampton between 1939 and 45. In from, in 1941, a new agreement was drawn up between the hospital and the Ministry of Pensions for a 60-year term, providing limbless ex-servicemen, providing limbless ex-servicemen received priority. The hospital could now be used for general medical and surgical patients. That was the public. And the civilians included women, women and children. The hospital was bombed in 1940 as you will see here, and 1944, with incendiary devices and flying bombs. A high explosive bomb in 1944 seriously damaged Roehampton House and the hospital was evacuated for a short period. In the last year of the war, nearly 22,000 patients were treated at the limb fitting center and 13 and a half thousand limbs were sent by post. At the same time, 2000 civilian cases were treated and about 500 limbs were mailed to those patients. The ministry continued its comprehensive service to the war wounded, including training patients for the for, the, for their employment and a new limb fitting centre was opened in February 44 with facilities for lectures and films and, and in addition to treating patients was used for teaching purposes and demonstrations. Here you see some of the patients in the physiotherapy pool and again there were a range of rehabilitation facilities, but it certainly improved since the First World War. Queen Mary's welcomed visitors from all parts of the world to see its work. It had developed a worldwide reputation in excellence for the care of amputees and the provision of artificial limbs. 
as well as orthopedics, the established departments of plastic surgery, neurosurgery, and general medicine had expanded to cope with the influx of casualties. Here we are at a sports day at Roehampton. We have many of many of these films within our archive, and you can see many more on the website. Sir Harold Gillis was a very famous plastic surgeon specializing in the treatment of burns, particularly perhaps burns of the face. And he is, is well known today amongst surgeons as a, a pioneer of plastic surgery. Of course, these surgeons had so many patients to work on that needed treatment, but they also learned from the experience. Here, I'm going to talk about one of our, um, what you want to say, high profile, quite notorious patients in a way, Douglas Bader. I think most people would at least know his name. He actually lost his legs before the Second World War, performing aerobatics. But he was such a proficient pilot and with two artificial limbs, he was able to join the Air Force, be a wartime pilot and led a very meritorious career. Uh, eventually, he was shot down and he arrived in a prisoner of war camp. But because he was so well known and respected, the Germans um, allowed a plane to fly over and drop his limbs in enemy territory. And so he had artificial limbs to wear in the prisoner of war camp because they'd actually saved his life in the aircraft because he'd had to bail out, but he was only able to bail out because he could leave his two he released them and left his two artificial limbs in the, um, back in the aircraft. Otherwise, he would have been trapped by his legs and would have perished at that time. He was knighted in 1976 for his charity work. Here he is on a special visit, probably post-war. And here he is with... Uh, Wicker, Alan Wicker, who some of you might remember, and also Morecambe of Morecambe and Wise, and that's Douglas Bader on the left. Uh, another tranche of patients that we need to mention, because they were very important at Queen Mary's, were the FIPOs, the Far Eastern Prisoners of War. They came back to England absolutely emaciated, either um, um, from tropical diseases or general malnutrition in prison camps, particularly in the notorious Japanese prisoner of war camps. And here we have several of these, um, these drawings that were made by one of the prisoners, obviously an artist who was a, a, in one of these camps. And you can just see the absolute degradation and um, appalling conditions that these patients lived in. And here we are, just a reminder, this was the bridge, the famous bridge on the River Kwai that these um, prisoners built um, in their, they were used in their thousands to build the railway and the bridge on the River Kwai. But here we are, a much more cheerful picture post-war, when the prisoners are back of England in the specialist ward that they had. And you will see how the ones that did survive recovered so well with efficient and effective treatment and care. So post-war and recent. The hospital did not join the NHS actually until 1961. Queen Mary's was acquired by Westminster Hospital and integrated fully into the NHS. The staff, the medical students and nurses needed more experience than they were able to get at Westminster Hospital. And so they, Roehampton became part of Westminster and they came down to work at um, Roehampton in due course. 
17 pupil nurses came down for placements on the wards from Westminster Hospital. And actually, I can go far as far back as that because I was a student nurse at um, Westminster Hospital and was a staff nurse in the School of Nursing. And I brought down these pupil nurses to do some ward practice before they came down permanently. Um, it really, it seemed way out of London at the time to us, rather in the country. That was the impression we received. It was rather old fashioned. We were welcomed and um, it was it was in a way quite a release from the from working in a London hospital with rather rigid rules, etc. Queen Mary's was slightly more relaxed or, or that's how we perceived it. And so anyway, uh, uh, a certain number of Westminster Hospital uh, nurses would come down and rotate. And then in 1963, it was actually approved for nurse training. So then student nurses came down and this went on for several years. And obstetric and gyne uh, obstetrics and gynecology beds were open and an um, accident and emergency department and around that time, an intensive care unit came into being. So it became much more a general hospital, but it's still very much focused and was world famous for its treatment of um, the war wounded and other patients who were amputees from all over England. But it was a separate, very much a separate, um, building and uh, departments away from the hospital. And in fact, when I worked at Queen Mary's, I wasn't really aware of it being attached to Queen Mary's at all. And that was when I came back to work there properly in the 1970s. Also in 1963, the League of Friends was founded to support patient comfort and also to support nursing staff to provide extra amenities for patients. And the Friends, of which I'm a trustee now, and uh, the Archive Committee is now subsumed, if you like, within the Friends. Uh, the Friends makes a continue, has made a continuous contribution to the welfare of patients over the years. In 1963 was the year that the children's prosthetic unit was opened at Queen Mary's, specifically following the thalidomide disaster. You will remember when pregnant women took a, what was a sort of sleeping tablet at the time. It was called thalidomide. It's, uh, the, one of the trade names was Distival. I remember women having um, been given the, the these pills, uh, unfortunately, but it caused, we didn't know at the time, it caused malformation of the limbs of embryos, where, uh, if the woman was pregnant, obviously. So this was a real disaster. In 1974, Queen Mary's be officially became a district general hospital and a limb surgery unit was opened. And this was, to address an appalling lack of communication between, between surgeons and prosthetic rehabilitation services. And this was first identified as far back as 1943. Surgeons really had to understand prosthetics and prosthesis had to understand the work of surgeons because it was very important that limbs were fashioned through surgery in such a way that they could comfortably fit artificial limbs, if at all possible. Here is Dr. John Clark, who was a burns and plastic surgeon, a very famous burns and plastic surgeon at Queen Mary's. This is, I'll just show you a few slides about Westminster Hospital. This was our nursing sister's uniform, and I was uh, later a, um, a nursing sister at Westminster before I came to Roehampton, and both at Westminster and Roehampton, I wore this uniform for some years as uh, a night sister, in fact. 
covering Roehampton Hospital. And we have some pictures here of the thalidomide children I've spoken about, the Leon Gillis unit. And this is a photo of Louise. All, all these photos, of course, had permission to show and um, keep in our archives. This is Louise Mason. She died not long ago, unfortunately, but she was a real activist in the thalidomide environment as she grew older. And you can see she was very, very incapacitated. And I think I remember in later life, she never wore her artificial limbs at all. She, she actually preferred to, they, they felt more mobile, more free, as you can imagine, when they were so stunted in growth often they felt better without artificial limbs. But artificial lower limbs could be particularly useful because of course it helped their, did help their mobility. And they could go, some of the children could go to normal school in them. But their little appendages at the top, they often found these easier to use than artificial limbs. But we did try over the years, an awful lot of effort was being put in to develop artificial limbs for children. And here are some of the children that would come in to be fitted with artificial limbs and then to have the training. And this poor little boy was wearing um, protection for his head, because obviously if you've lost all limbs, you're, you, know, you can very quickly lose your balance. Here's a young man, an amputee on a, a bike, doing very well. And here's another little boy, uh, lost both limbs. Yeah, very difficult for them. And you can see it in his face, can't you? Here he is again, trying to cook. So into the 90s and now. Now, this was a typical 90s ward. In fact, this was the ward at Roehampton until the old hospital was knocked down. And I well remember those wards. I was night sister in the a night manager in the um, 1980s. And I worked for many years on night duty. And I used to cover four hospitals at night. Queen Mary's Putney, which is now gone. Bath Hospital, which is still with us and St. John's Battersea, which was just on St. John's Hill, which I think is now luxury fat. And I used to go around and visit them at night and help out in A&E or wherever I was needed. And I loved that work actually, but this was the, these were the long wards and one would go around all the patients at night and um, the nurses would have to know everyone. And you know, there were advantages in these long wards. They no, are no longer with us, but you could actually see your patients and patients could see you. And we didn't really um, worry about the lack of privacy, actually. I, I was a patient in one of these at one time and actually you felt quite safe and secure. And I think um, to a certain extent, we've lost quite a bit with patients tucked up in rooms where you can't see them and it's not so easy for them to call a nurse but the nurses in the ward had to know every patient and their name and a lot more besides. And here we are, later I moved in the, in the 1990s to manage the limb fitting centre. It, it changed its name to the Regional Rehabilitation Centre. And we had patients from far and wide and these little twins from Ethiopia were separated. They were conjoined twins and they came to us to be fitted with artificial limbs. Uh, what, they needed one for each child, but actually they got around quite well on those crutches. When little children are small and light, they can use these arm crutches incredibly well. And they were so cheerful. We had other twins. We had two, two girls from Ireland who were joined much higher up and they, 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 we couldn't do an awful lot for them, but um, we did our best. But they had they were sort of two heads and a joined body. And it was, um, you know, conjoined twins. Some are um, luckier than others, if you like. So we're, we'll come here to uh, partly because I could go on forever, but time limits me. But we'll come to more modern days in the new hospital, 
And you can see again, as I say, a lot more if you go to our website. And there are some marvelous videos there where you can really see different sections of the work of the current Douglas Bader Rehabilitation Workshop. Here we see a light whim of the limb of today with some electronic components. It still doesn't look very glamorous, but they're very much lighter to use and more mobile. And I think on the left, you'll find that the fingers move electronically. You can see a wire going into the hand. And really, they, we've come on in leaps and bounds. But the old hook, and you can see it on the right, can still be useful. And some patients find those hooks immensely helpful, particularly as you can learn to, with sensors to use them quite flexibly, far more flexibly than in the past. And this is Ray Edwards. He, lost, he had septicemia as an adult and lost all four limbs. I know Ray. Um, he obviously comes back to the hospital for limb fitting regularly. And he does absolutely everything you can think of. And here he is up a mountain somewhere. And he... Uh, runs a company, he has his own business, and he uh, runs a company and um, builds adaptations or change, does ad adaptations in the home for other people with disabilities. And of course, he well understands their, the, the issues they have to confront in everyday life. And here's Ray again in our uh, in the basement. Our little we have a little exhibition and museum with lots of iPad material which you can visit. And uh, here is Ray in front of his photograph there in one of the cabinets with another patient. I'm not sure how I do know Gemma. I can't remember how she lost her limb, but some young people lose limbs through a, what we call a, a bone cancer called sarcoma. And, but Gemma's doing very well, and she has what you call osseointegration, and the limb is actually attached to the bone in her leg. It is a lot more flexible to use, and you don't take it off, well, you unscrew it, you unscrew it from the top, but basically it's joined to you. And many of the younger limb users, they like them just to be exposed, they like to sh just to for people to see, you know, that they've lost a limb and they're not in any way um, concerned about showing that to the general public. And here we are, here's a rehabilitation class going on in the modern department. Quite a few diabetics I, um, lose their limbs from circulatory problems and infection problems because they have high blood sugars. It's, um, they're, they're more likely to get um, infections and neuropathy. They lose the feeling in their toes, et cetera. And this causes injury. And so we have quite a lot of diabetics. We used to get more smokers. You can get, um, you could, that can influence your circulation, particularly if you have poor circulation. So it isn't only people wounded in accidents. It's a, also a disease process. Here we are osseointegration limb again. And here is Martine Wright. She was the victim, one of the victims in one of the tube bombings several years ago. And um, she represented us at the Paralympics, one of the Paralympics a few years ago. And Martine does a lot of work and she um, now gives inspirational uh, speeches and she I've heard her she is truly inspirational she now has a family and this is um, I can't, won't can't show you the video today because I simply haven't got time but this is Derek Campbell and Danny English two of our patients there's a lovely video on our website um, them talking to each other they were great friends unfortunately I I think it, one of them, I think Danny, um, it was um, the gentleman on the left, I think he was Danny, and unfortunately he died soon after this video was taken, but his family was so pleased that it was taken and they're quite happy for it to be shown. 
so here we have Roehampton House today. It's gone back to being the stately house it was originally, but now with multiple occupancy because it's been converted into luxury flats. But selling the site, the NHS selling the site enabled us to build a modern community hospital as we see today. And that community hospital will be in the future, I'm sure, as it is now, a real asset and facility for the local community around it. So do look at our website. And if you wish, get in, get in touch with the friends of Queen Mary's Hospital, Roehampton.